So the question, the first question is, this is the prescriptive part of the, uh, of the presentation, what, the what should you do part. Um, if you're a local ebook reseller, what do you have to do to compete? Well, first of all, you have to carry titles in all languages. That is, you are not going to compete if you don't. You have to deliver multi-device functionality. You're not going to be able to compete if you don't. There are features in each of these ebook readers. I talk about sometimes they can enable lending, sometimes they don't. Sometimes there are dictionaries built in, not always. Sometimes there's an ability to, to, to create notes or share notes. Those features, in my opinion, are not definitive. In other words, I don't think that most ebook readers use many features. Most people just read the book, I believe. But the, but the features are definitive for some parts of the audience. So anybody developing a local ebook uh, delivery capability has to keep that in mind, has to match the features. Now, for example, Google has come out, you can't dog ear a page, you can't do underlining, they haven't gotten there yet. Um, I'm reading some books on Google, it's a perfectly fine reading experience, but it is sort of annoying not to be able, no dictionary, I tap the word no dictionary. Now by the way, I tap the word on Amazon, which has a dictionary, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And that's another aspect of this, which will be cleaned up over time but which consumers are now noticing not everything is perfect. Delivering customer service is very important and that's going to become a differentiator. There are opportunities to provide local propositions for libraries and institutions of various kinds and there's opportunities to get content from local content sources, corporations, uh, local governments, laws, re government reports, all sorts of things that various people might want to read which are not likely to be on the radar screens for Amazon, Apple, Google, and Kobo, which a local uh, e-tailer could, could have in their selection. And the other thing that is very important to keep in mind is that local in-store support and promotion can be very, very important. And I think that the retailers, that right now, I know, I know I've know, i learned a lot in the last uh, couple of weeks about the fact that the publishers own a lot of the retailers and the publishers, if they want to slow this thing down, they don't need to push the retailers into it too fast. But I think that the retailers who start selling e-reading devices, and particularly if they create ways to funnel the people who buy those e-reading devices to their store, to buy the books. I think that they're going to steal an advantage from those who wait. And remember that the biggest readers come first. So if you wait, you lose the biggest readers to the people who go early, which is what happened to everybody with Amazon. Retailers need to think about their local strengths. They need to figure out how to work with local authors and, as I said, with IP providers and brands to capture unique content internally. And brands can be any company. I mean, well, I was, yesterday I was at AT Kearney um, talking to some, doing a briefing of, of this talk to some executives. AT Kearney produces a lot of intellectual property. Now, some of it is for clients who pay a lot of money for it and don't want to see it distributed. Some of it is created and three months later, everybody would be delighted to let the world see it and it would be of value. In the print world, that's not really a very practical uh, opportunity. In the ebook world, it's a huge opportunity. So maximizing your knowledge of the local content silos, understanding the pricing practices in your area, and of course, rights. Rights is a big issue. Um, our first speaker this morning was talking about how ebooks should be and how they aren't and why is it this way. Why is it this way? Rights. That's why it's this way, because the first rule you learn when you enter book publishing and sell rights 
is acquire rights broadly, license rights narrowly. Never give a right away that you don't have to give away. And that is a hundred years of rights trading history where rights have been fragmented intentionally by agents to maximize the revenue for authors. And we can't just roll this back by fiat. This is going to be our reality to live with for a long time. Also, every publisher in the world and every retailer has a huge opportunity to market, but particularly to publishers, to market to their own language customers globally. I don't know how many people can read Italian in the United States. It's not important for me to know that. It's very important for you to know that. It's not a small number. It's a measurable number. And you have to find ways. And those people cluster. They cluster around websites. They cluster around. There's a, I've been to Hoboken. I've gone to the local community organization where Italian is spoken as much as English when, you, when you're mixing with the people there. Somehow or another, you have to find ways to put your product in front of those consumers. So this is sort of a list of things that I think that publishers should be thinking about. The first lesson I think is really important, and this is one we learned in the United States. Don't waste your time and don't waste your effort trying to defend print. Print will yield to digital over time, and it's, it's hopeless. You're holding back the tide, trying to change it. The amount of difference that you can make is very small, and it's a bad diversion of effort. You want to be thinking about how to profit from the change, not how to prevent nature from happening. Secondly, rethink all of your capabilities, all of your IP, all of your networks to gain advantage in digital. And that means both the products and the marketing. Which products of yours most lend themselves to digital sales? Which products of yours most lend themselves to some sort of enhancement or different kind of ebook. Which base of titles do you have that gives you an opportunity to capture an audience? Do you have, if you're the publisher of more books on soccer in Italy than any other publisher, you have a foundation to build an audience that you can own. Okay, so whatever that subject is, and there are many big subjects and small subjects, if you have a stake in that, in that marketplace, you can do new things with it digitally. Third, do not be fooled by the relative small size of the market and what you think might be the protective barriers around the print. I know that the VAT is higher on the e-book than it is on the print book. I know that the uh, that the publishers here control retail and, are in a, and are, are, there's a small number of large publishers that you're in a position to slow things down. Um, I know that the ebook market in Italy is less than 1%. Um, all of these things are true. I guarantee you this will happen faster than you think. And if you restrain the movement of books in Italian to digital, you will start to lose customers to English. And you're going to lose them anyway, because there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of titles available in English in EPUB. There is a small number of thousands of titles available in Italian in EPUB. I told you what my experience was shopping from 50,000 titles. It was very unsatisfying. You have some significant portion of your population who would prefer to read in Italian, but they would prefer to read what they want to read in English than what they don't want to read in Italian. And you take a big risk if you try to slow down the market. Verticals. Now, verticals, be conscious of verticals. What I mean by verticals are audience-driven collections of information or, or, or content. Big publishers here and in the United States are not vertical. They are horizontal. They publish anything if it's big enough. They only care that it be big enough. That is a bad way to think in the future. 
because as the books, you can do that as long as there are bookstores. Because as long as there are bookstores, the publisher can put in a box a cookbook, a travel book, a novel, a memoir, a political book, and the, when it gets to the bookstore, they'll sort it out, right? They'll put it on the cookbook shelf and the travel book shelf, and they'll arrange it so the public can find it. But the bookstores aren't going to be there anymore. And the online marketing at a bookstore, when you search the cookbook section, is not going to be the only way that people are going to find out about cookbooks. They're going to find out about cookbooks on a thousand websites and blogs where conversations about cooking is taking place. You must be there. If you possibly can, you must own some of those websites, or you're not going to be able to do cookbooks anymore. One story, an agent told me in New York that, uh, I don't know, I hope you have the category mind, body, spirit, big category in the United States. And an agent sold a mind, body, spirit book to Random House for an author. They sold 20,000 copies. 12, I'm sorry, 12,000 copies. They sold the author's next book to Hay House. Tiny little publisher, Hay House. But they only do mind, body, spirit. They sold 200,000 copies. Random House cannot compete for mind, body, spirit books anymore. Big publishers are going to lose markets, niche by niche, to small publishers who are in those markets. This is an opportunity that's wide open to everybody now, but it won't stay wide open. And the last point is you must develop workflows that don't make it di difficult or expensive to deliver electronic books simultaneously with print books. You have to have workflows that will deliver both for you. So this is, my, this is the wrap-up slide, which is we're all together here now. We're all global publishers. Um, the English language ones are a little luckier because uh, from an American point of view, only 20% of English speakers live in the United States. 80% of them are all over, scattered all over the rest of the world. Now, you don't have an opportunity of that magnitude, but you do have an opportunity that is similar in kind. Um, what you need to do, first of all, whatever you think of American companies and whatever would be your attitude toward collaborating with them, you must know Amazon, Apple, and Google like an American. They are going to be here. They're not all here now. By three years from now, I guarantee you that they will be an extraordinarily large presence intruding on your market. You must know them. You must work with them. Secondly, you have to rethink how you exploit your own intellectual property. Should you do an English language edition of something for which you did not sell the English language rights? Or maybe you should put English and Italian together in one edition, which you can sell as a dual language book. These kinds of things, in my opinion, are much more worthy experiments than figuring out how to put video in a book. These are things that relate to how people read. And I don't have answers. I only have ideas and questions because nobody's tried these things yet. Simp third point, I know this is really difficult because agents don't like it, but you really should start trying to acquire for Italy if you have capabilities in Italy that are special capabilities. I know this is the opposite of global. It's, gl it's called glocalization with a combination of global and local. You are, no matter how global you try to be, you're going to have more power here than you have someplace else. And you can, and if English becomes something that people are reading a lot here, you're going to be able to sell it more effectively than a publisher who's based in New York or London. Now, the big agents are not going to let you have English language rights to Italy. But there are a lot of negotiations that every publisher is involved in where they call the shots because they're the only ones bidding. And I think if you can get English language rights to Italy on one book in 10 that you acquire, by five years from now, you'll be very happy you've done it. 